minister to us tonight. Uh, over the course, for those of you that may not be aware or haven't been around very long, but over the course of time, uh, we have had several occasions, even among our uh, youth and hyphen age ministries, we have had moments and opportunity where we have allowed or we have given opportunity and way for those that are aspiring to be in ministry, those that desire to grow in those areas of ministry, and those that are just uh, that some some that are licensed, some that don't always have the opportunity, but sister. Melinda and I again in the vein in which we are in where we feel like we're moving and continuing to develop tonight is going to be what we call a fresh fire style evening so we have five individuals that pastor has chosen uh, some young men some young women that I can't think uh, of enough ways to express my confidence uh, my trust, my faith, my belief in each of you, gifted in all of unique ways. And again, it is so important to us that we practice what we say we believe. Uh, and so if we're going to be a church, and we've always been not just tonight, a church that invests and a church that develops. And we've done these type things in Axemen and, and other venues among our youth, as I said. And so it's amazing to see that there is so much in the body of Christ. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do in different venues through each of you as you have opportunity, be a Corinth group or other venues to be able to share your story as we even make more opportunities here at the POM. It is going to be powerful. They are each going to have an opportunity to speak up to 10 minutes and I know that us as the church family, we're going to get behind them. They may be slightly nervous. I told them I am every time that I get behind the pulpit. I think if you're not nervous, there's something wrong because it perhaps borders on arrogance or pride understanding that this is a sacred desk it doesn't belong to me it is God's and never is there an opportunity that we are worthy to stand behind that sacred desk I have the utmost confidence and faith that these individuals have prepared themselves with prayer and fasting I trust that God has spoken to them you are going to be very much blessed by the ministry and the eclectic uh, uniqueness of each and so as they get up here tonight and do their best let's be supportive let's love them let's open our hearts and let's always have an ear to hear what God is speaking I have told them and I'm going to get out of the way that this is not a performance this is not a competition this is not a matter of how they do uh, I don't want them being anybody but themselves so tonight we're going to hear from Brother Chase Hudson who does hold license with the United Pentecostal Church he is a licensed minister from Jade Bushel who is a hyphen and a wonderful young lady of God also serving in so many ministries in this church. Brother Cody Navarro again serving in so many areas with our youth and our young people teaching he and Ashley. Brother Sebastian who has the calling of God upon his life and his wonderful family. They're new here but God has got his hand upon him and he has a desire to develop in our own sister Allison Brooks that God is certainly doing a great work in her and we know the many ways that she serves including helping to care for these facilities throughout the week that none of us see. So sister Allison is not just in the spotlights singing songs on Sunday and Wednesday. She is up here throughout the week working diligently and uh, she does things that probably not a lot of people would want to do but a heart to serve, a heart to give and with some of the things she's been through in her life, a ministry that is being birthed no doubt. And so tonight, why don't we all stand to our feet and would you help me welcome our first speaker, Reverend Chase Hudson. very deeply and I am no, uh, just humbled and blessed to be standing before you this evening. If you would, if you have your Bibles, we'll be turning to 2 Samuel 12 and 20. As you do, I want to give honor to a few people before we start, of course, our Lord and Jesus Christ, before none of this is possible. And of course, our precious pastor and our precious first lady. I thank the two of you for your devotion to all of our families, to my family. Thank you from the deepest place of my heart for you know what we have faced the last four or five years. And stand, it is a standing testament in God's hand and your leadership and love for where I am to be standing here today. I also want to thank my precious wife you know, for her support, her love, and when I probably do, don't even deserve it. And of course, my precious daughters who are next door. God is showing his mighty grace and mercy and blessing upon all that we faced. 
Again, we'll be reading from 2 Samuel 12 and 20. I could easily take up all my time this evening with giving accolades to all you beautiful and wonderful, precious people. But I believe that the Lord has given me a word and I have to give it. I have to just go straight through. So if you have 2 Samuel 12 and 20, give me an amen. 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 And the word says that David arose from the earth and was washed and anointed himself. And if you'll say with me, and changed his apparel. And came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. You may be seated. So as we read this scripture text, it comes at a time that is an ending sad chapter in the life of King David. And a newness that we actually don't see, which is a reset and a paradigm shift. Two of many words that we have heard over the last few months here at Palm. You see, in the, second, in the start of 2 Samuel, Nathan the prophet stands before the king. But see, it's a King David at that point in the words of today that is somewhat backslidden. This is a, this is a David that is thrown and he's understanding too well the feeling of the power of the crown and the title that he carries on his head. This is no longer the David that was upon the battlefield, but this was no longer the warrior of the past, but instead the one that was now sending men to the battlefield. This is now the man walking the corridors of his throne and no longer going out with his own men. This is to say that David has now become over, overburdened every day with the burdens of life and the kingship. Now he is starting to feel the pressure, thus the lust of his own flesh. So as prophet Nathan begins to tell King David as he stands before him, he starts to tell him a story. In the early scriptures of 2 Samuel, he tells him the story of the rich man who took the poor man's prized lamb. The lamb cared that this poor man cared for since birth, raised around, he raised it around his children. It ate from the poor man's cup. This was a prized possession of this poor man. But the rich man, looking upon the lamb, did not want to take one from his own herd of mighty lambs. Instead, took one to slaughter it for a meal with his guest. In saying, King David became greatly kindled with fire and said, The Lord lives, this man deserves to die. And it was at that moment that Nathan turned to the king and said, Thou art that man. Could you imagine King David at that moment realizing his mind turning over and over of over those past things that recently transpired in his mind? Those things that he had just realized that he had done? And then only to hear over the next several verses as Nathan called out, the very things that he tried to keep hidden, the very things that he had done to Uriah the Hittite, the things that he had done to steal Uriah's wife and now bear a son that, with another man's wife. King David realizing, realizing all that he had done and that uh, what God had done for him in the fat past and that now he had fallen out of God's grace. In that moment, King David had a choice, as we all do when we faced certain things. We hear and we can be accountable or we can deny and run from it. In that moment, we find that David did the first. As we see in the scripture, 2 Samuel 12 and 13, it said, At that moment, David said and to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. But King David, immediately, as he immediately repented and we see Nathan responded through the forgiving and said your sin would put away but we also have to understand that this was another dispensation of the law not under dispensation of grace which brings a whole nother lesson that we can't get through tonight there was always a price to be paid and here we see King David's newborn son becomes ill at that time, King David began to fast for seven days. He laid on the floor throughout the night for seven nights. They tried to bring him in to get food. He refused. He laid upon his, his, his own garments. They became tattered with dirt and covered with all that he could because he would not give up to the fasting. But yet, in verse 19, we find the child has died. In our scripture text, David stands 
dusts himself off, cleans up, changes his clothes, and goes to worship. King David realized that in those seven days what he had done to Uriah, who was very, which was very bad. And dis- but King David knew God, and he knew God was faithful. So King David turned his heart back to God, and we see this in the promise in the psalmist that he penned in Psalm 51. I wish we had the time for me to read the verses. If you have the opportunity, read Psalms 51. It will show you the heart of King David, and it transpires right back to those scriptures in 2 Samuel 12. It shows the heart of a man of God. But in verse 20, when David stood from the apparel change, I tell you this day, it was not simply the physical apparel change. David had a spiritual apparel change. That was at that step back in the worshiper that he was. It was the worshiper that when he went to Obed-Edom and he went to get the ark, that he would not go any further than seven steps before he became and would worship with all that he had. And it was at that point that David became the worshiper that he used to be. Some would ask, why did he not just get up and go straight into the sanctuary? King David understood he was no longer a mourner. He was no longer a man of pity. He was no longer a man of iniquity. King David understood that he was a chosen child of God and he was there to represent the house of God. Thereby he stood up, cleaned himself, changed his apparel inside and out and went before the Lord. There he gave honor and worship to the king before he would acknowledge his own flesh by giving it food. So mighty family of palm. Some of us need to change our spiritual apparel. I'm not calling anyone a backslider. Yet I'm so often than not, we get overrun with the burdens of life and we find ourselves putting on spiritual sackcloth and fast and pray and other issues we are facing. While this is notable and we need it, the problem that we are and what we are facing is we forget to take it off. When we step away from the altar where the God has given or taken away the request, we continue to walk around in sackcloth of pity and failure around us. We fail that when we start to feel because we keep this on that we are unworthy and that we can't move forward because we carry the sackcloth. We want to be faced that still lingers in us and that we do not follow the spirit. This so-called sackcloth of spirit also carried around only causes to hinder ourselves. We find ourselves doubting if we can do anything for the Lord. We doubt that the Lord speaks to us. We doubt when the pastor calls us for the body to be behind him. We cannot allow our spiritual garments to hinder ourselves or be a part of what God is calling us to do. We need a change of apparel. We need a garment of worship. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a living testimony to this. You have to understand in the past two years alone, three times have I have had to transition my job. In April of 2019, my life was tried to be taken by a sickness that tried to take me. Shortly thereafter, my precious daughter, the devil tried to take her, but we fought. For months upon months, we traveled across this country to get the medical care that she needed. And then five months ago, my precious mother passed. But it was during this camp meeting that I was prodded to remember all that God has done and continued to do for me and my family. In some way, we have to forget and seriously remember what he does in and day out. It was in that time of prayer I realized the garment change. I need my praise and my worship back. This is allowing me and my family to move forward and get behind the man of God like we never have. So I open that, Lord, oh, Jesus, lay the garments at the altar. Leave them there and let us change them, Lord, for garments of worship and praise. In Jesus' name. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Thank you. I have the pleasure, no, I have the honor, and I sincerely mean that, the honor to introduce our next guest speaker, Sister Jade. What a precious, sincere heart. You know, I... You know, it's, it's easy to know someone when you go have a cup of coffee. But when you can stand next to someone and just feel the presence of God and the sincerity of the prayer, and I just, it's humble to be 
introducing this a mighty woman of God. Let's give us a hand. Praise the Lord, Tom. So excited to be here before you again. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I would love to give honor to my pastor and Sister Melinda, <laughs> who have considered me trustworthy enough to allow me to stand here in this sacred place. Once again, to me, they are the truest examples of what we strive for as Christians. They're so sincere, and they are people that look at the heart, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. They're not looking at, you know, the outward appearance and what walks through their doors, but they look at people's hearts. And to me, that's, that's something that you don't see a lot, and it's so special. And I'm, I just want to say I'm thankful to belong to a church body that has poured so much into me and constantly encouraged me time and time again. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I don't know that I'm gonna take up all the, the time that I was allotted. I feel like this is probably gonna be one of my quickest ones. Um, but I would like to say, you know, I like to say what God put on my heart and, you know, keep it moving. Um, and my, <laughs> my notes often re like reflect my chaotic thoughts, but <laughs> I pray that somebody's catching what I'm going to try to say tonight. <laughs> and if nothing else, I believe that God wants somebody to know that something is about to happen. Amen. He's about to do something. And if that sounds vague, it's because it is. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Habakkuk 1, 1 through 5. And I'm reading from the ESV version. says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Violence, coronavirus, injustice, there's riots, there's looting, there's unemployment, there's death. Why don't you see? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. I read that and I said, God, why is there so much going on? It feels, sometimes it feels like it's too much. And we look at the situation and we say, wow, the world wasn't like this. These are the times, these times that we're living in are terrifying. And they are until you remember that there's nothing new under the sun. This isn't something that's just happening by accident. This isn't something that's co like completely unprecedented. The Lord answered him and said, look among the nation and see Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So I read that and I thought, wow, relief is coming. <laughs> so I read that. I read that in the book of Habakkuk, you know, as one does. And I was immediately struck, stricken by how familiar that sounded. Oh, I'm sorry. You can be seated. I'm done. That's my, done. That's my scriptures. That's, I'm done. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you guys were still standing. <laughs> so the, the prophet Habakkuk is crying out to the Lord. And he's inquiring about the violence in the world and among the people. And the prophet cried out to God. And he was confused. And he was getting ready to raise up the Chaldeans among, against them for correction. Right. So he says, look among the nation and see wonder and be astounded for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. And I immediately thought that meant relief. God is going to do something. God is going to, to fix the situation. 
but God was telling them that he was raising up the Chaldeans. He was getting ready to raise up the Chaldeans against them. More violence. But God told the prophet to tell the people to get ready. The people of God needed to know what was about to happen. But it started with a man who cried out to God on behalf of his people. And I, I realized as I was reading this that often the interpretation of violence comes through the voice of the prophet or the pastor. The voice of the prophet gives way to the vision from God. Hosea 12 and 10 says, I spoke to the prophets, and it was I who multiplied visions, and through the prophets gave parables. As I was reading, I realized that violence filtered through the voice of the prophet gives way to vision. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 says, and the Lord answered me. And said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. Habakkuk, in the NIV version, it says, the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tables, tablets, so that a herald may run with it. A herald is an official messenger that brings news. Or as a verb, it says to be a sign that something is about to happen. I feel like God wants somebody to know today that we must get the vision from the voice of the prophet and run to let somebody know that God's about to do something. I'm glad Brother Chase said it first because we need to get behind the man of God. Something is about to happen, and if you don't get behind the man of God, you're going to miss it. God's getting ready to do something unbelievable. And if the man of God has the vision, I'm running because there are people that need to know of the glory of the Lord. Habakkuk 2 and 14 says, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Church. We believe, or we say we believe, that these are the last days, that this is unprecedented times, that we've never seen anything like this, and that God is coming back. And if that may be true, why are we waiting? Why are we just sitting down lackadaisically waiting for just whatever to overtake us? I believe that in times of violence, we need to be looking to the man of God. We need to be filtering the violence and everything that's going on around us through the man of God. And we need to catch the vision. So now, I just want to leave you with this. And the choice is yours. But are you going to lay down and die? Or are you going to run with the vision? Are you going to follow the man of God? Are you going to lift him up when he says that we need to be a Monday night prayer? Are you going to lift him up when he says that we can't act a certain way? We can't talk a certain way. We can't look a certain way. Are you going to just surrender to the violence? Or are you going to run with the vision? So now I get to introduce 
probably one of the coolest people at the POM. <laughs> For the Cody Navarro, I haven't had a, a long time to spend with him and I haven't um, gotten to spend a lot of personal time with him, but I've, in getting closer to the youth group lately, I've um, just gotten to enjoy his presence and his, um, his company and uh, be around them. And I, I think honestly that his heart for serving and his heart for the young people is something to be admired. It's amazing to me when people devote themselves to the youth because a lot of the time people forget where they came from and how, how it is when you're a young person. And I think that somebody that's going to, to spend time and go out of their way to raise up young people and encourage them in the knowledge of God is incredible. And that's something not to take lightly. So just want to go ahead and introduce Brother Cody Navarro. times where I feel like I haven't met that goal yeah so thank you for sharing that um first off I give honor I give honor to pastor sister Melinda or like Amelia says sister Linda um <laughs> me and pastor said we've had some hard talks and he's guided me and led me in some directions that I needed. Sister Melinda's always been there for us. Their love for this church, the love for us, for this family. We're just not, we're not just people to these precious pastors, Sister Melinda. We're their children. <laughs> and I love y'all dearly. I give honor to my parents. My parents are here tonight. It's an honor to have them here to hear me. <laughs> Even though I might have put my dad through some physical abuse. <laughs> if you want to hear some stories, you can ask him. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't be the man today if it wasn't for them too. And then to my precious wife, I didn't forget you this time. <laughs> I... <laughs> She is the rock. Her, <laughs> if you don't know her, very feisty. She's, she's a blue gold person. So she's going to share her feelings with you. It might be kind of blunt at first, but I, I get it later. Like, oh, I feel so bad for doing that or saying that. So <laughs> and then my precious daughter, for all you praise team people, if you're, if you think you're not being watched you're being watched she gets up here she gets up to her room <laughs> it's something about heels it came natural she gets up to her room and she grabs her microphone and she sings and she's watching y'all and she talks about y'all at home I'm, I'm gonna sing like sister Amber or Hamber. I'm going to sing like Sister Allison. I'm going to sing like Jade. She, she talks about y'all. She wanted to actually get up here and preach with me. And I was like, no, baby, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so, all right. So, <laughs> I'm going to jump into my scripture first. So, if you flip to Matthew 20, 14, 28 through 31. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on the water, Jesus said, yes, I mean, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified 
and began to sink. Peter screamed out, save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said, why did you doubt me? So my title tonight is Fearful and Fearless. And y'all may be seated. Fearful and fearless, two opposing meanings. Fearful meaning you're full of fear. Fearless mean you have no fear. If you're like me, I have a deathly afraid of snakes. I can actually say I have a phobia. I, <laughs> I will start shaking and crying, and I have to work up my confidence to kill one. And I'm sorry. I am sorry. If you're a snake lover or a snake person, all snakes are bad to me. It, it could be the little bittiest one. Uh, I'm sorry. It's no. So, <laughs> fearful. All right, like I said, fearful is a way of being full of fear. We all face it. We all face full fear. But, you know, when God was speaking to me about this, I got to thinking about it. Fearful. Think about it. It could actually mean you have little faith in God. And fearless could mean you have full faith in God. So every time that we are faced with trials and tribulations, we always tend to be fearful of these situations going on in our lives that we forget who created us. He created us, so why would we not fear this man above? He could, <laughs> he could take... He could take your life at this second if he needed you to go up there with him. I'm af- I'll be honest with you. I'm afraid because I feel like I'm not ready to go with him yet. I haven't done what he's asked me to do. So I fear that. We get all these blessings. We get all the goods from him that we forget that he created us. That he's taken away all the bad. You know, if we look back in the Bible at Jonah 1.3, Jonah was called. He called Jonah, and what did Jonah do? He ran. He ran from his calling. So instead of fearing God, he feared his calling. And we all know what happened. He got swallowed up by the well. Well, I mean, that's a lesson. (laughs) If we uh, look at Exodus 4.10, Moses, he was afraid to go to speak to Pharaoh because he had a speech impediment. He couldn't speak clearly. But you see what God did. He helped him on that, and he placed Aaron in his life. 1 Samuel 18 and 12, King Saul, he was afraid of David because David saw favor in God, or David had favor in God, and it drove King Saul crazy. I would say two, of the, two out of the three of these people actually got the message. Like, oh, no, I should fear God before I just fear all this stuff. I don't want to get swallowed by a whale again, so I better do what he tells me to do. You know, instead of that bush being on fire, I don't want to be on fire. I mean, I mean it's just a thing, like, come on now. So, you know, with all that being said, it's just... With the world we're going in right now, COVID, all, everything, just this world is crazy. And so many times we fear the things of the world instead of fearing God. Instead of fearing God and having faith in God, we fear the things of the world. And we can't let fear settle in. We can't let fear tear us down. There's people that need us. You know, I, I've talked to Brother Chase. i talked to my wife. You know, everybody talks about COVID. I kind of look at it as almost like a God sent thing. Because why would God want us to be in here when he can have us out in the field digging and working and reaching? God wants us. I I really think he sent COVID to get us out the doors to do some outreach. And it's crazy because how pastor sister melinda said they feel it now like we need to do some outreach we need to get poa launched it's a it's a god thing 
And the thing is, is I, I, I'm preaching to myself because I am probably one of the insecure people you know. I don't probably show it, but I, I am. I have faced anxiety. I have faced depression. I know what it feels like. But you know, God is calling me. He's calling y'all. He's calling every one of us to step out of our comfort zone and to start fearing God and start reaching the lost. Every one of us has got somebody in our life that we can reach. I have two brothers, and one told me that he don't think church is his place anymore. And I, and I don't receive that because I know he knows God and he knows where he belongs. I have one that got, the other one got confused of reading stuff that he shouldn't have been read, reading. And he's starting to question things. I mean, he's been questioning things, but I don't think he can't come back. I know he can come back. I know God can touch him wherever he's at. You know? (laughs) Philippians 4.13 says, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all know that verse. So let's start leaning on God and start leaning on ourselves. Stop fearing the world and start fearing God. We got to have that God fearing. We got to be God feared. A couple months ago, I sat right there where Brother Troy is. And there was a time in my life where I just started questioning things. I started questioning God. You know, I'm like, man, I'm facing a lot of fear. I'm facing a lot of anxiety. There was one time at the house recently that where I just broke down in anxiety. And I sat right there. And I told God, I said, I'm not getting up from this seat until I get a word from you. I said, God, I know you have something for me. I know you have something for me, God. And I need to know you're here with me. And I sat right there. And I, he, clear as day, he spoke to me. He spoke to me as it was clear. And I couldn't... <laughs> I shared it with my wife. I shared it with Pastor. And I just, I just, it was God. I mean, I just couldn't turn away from it. So I thank God for all that he's done in my life. I really do believe, which I am working on my anxiety and stuff, and I believe that I'm whole from it. I'm healed from that. Because I've noticed that I've grew in my faith. And I'm not looking back. And some of us need to do that. Some of us need to turn from the world and turn to God, turn from our ways, and stop looking back at who we were and to who we can become. We have to stand our ground to this world. This world has nothing for us. This world has nothing for us. We have to stand up against it and start reaching the loss. Start digging. It's like Brother Terry Shock said, start digging. <laughs> and as I'm closing, and I'm say this, share this, as I'm facing anxiety, facing that insecurity, you know, I'm teaching Crave class to these, you know, 14 to 10 year olds, and we have a 12 year old that told me, Brother Cody, and I was sharing her with my insecurity and stuff like that, issues. And she said, Brother Cody, she said, why would you be afraid of what you have to share if it came from God? If it came from God, why would you be afraid to share his word? And ever since she said that, it stuck with me. And I have not been afraid no more. I have shared it with people in my work. I have shared it with people not in my work. So we have to. Stop being afraid of what God has called us to be and start moving. <laughs> so now I get the honor of welcoming, I mean, welcoming a close friend of mine. He's new to the church. <laughs> he's, a, he's an emotional guy. And me and him, (laughs) where I, as I see it, like, okay, you know, we can just (laughs) move on, you know. 
him and my wife see is like this point of view, and I'm like, oh, okay. But this guy is special. Him and his family, and they, they have something special. They have a servant heart, and they mean the world to me and my family. A lot of y'all don't know. <laughs> Brother Ryan and sister Amber's not in here, but me and my wife, we had some young married couples in here, but when we started coming, but that was y'all coming was an answer to our prayers. We love having more young married couples coming. So I just wanted to say, you're a blessing to my life. You're an answer prayer. So let me help, let me help me welcome Sebastian. Man, isn't God amazing? I thought Brother Cody would save some blue for the rest of us, but, uh, you know, I, I told myself I wouldn't get too emotional when I came up here. Um, all right. So what Pastor doesn't know is he, he orchestrated, him and God orchestrated this beautiful lineup. But what he doesn't know is he threw me in the deep end, and I'm the one laying on my back breathing through a straw and floating on my back. Everybody else is swimming. I'm the one that's trying not to sing. But I'd first off like to say um, I give double honor to my pastor and Sister Melinda. First Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. A wise man once told me, some things are taught and some things are caught. But I had never heard anything about double honor until Brother Weidman Jr. said something about it, and it fits so perfectly because, honestly, they deserve so much more than double honor. Make some noise if you love your pastor and first lady. I'd also like to give, give honor to my beautiful wife. Without her and our beautiful babies, I don't know how lost in the world I would be. I'd, I've been through some things, and between her and God, I, I don't know if I'd be standing here. I don't know if I'd be locked up. I don't know if I'd be dead. Oh, like I said, I'm trying not to get emotional up here. My family and I are so thankful for this church that has become family and has welcomed us. The fellowship and love has done more to us than you could ever imagine. I'd like to first start off by reading Jeremiah 16, 16. If you'd stand with me. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, every hill and out of the holes of the rocks Matthew twenty-two fourteen. many are called but for you were chosen God doesn't call the qualified he qualifies the called so the question I'm asking today is are you qualified look at your neighbor put your finger on their nose and ask them are you qualified I figured I'd try something different. Usually people say poke you in the eye and do all the rough stuff. I, I figured just a little gentle love tap might help. All right, so you can maybe see it. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a jade. <laughs> all right, so you don't have to be, have a college degree or a high school diploma to be qualified. Not anywhere have I read that has everyone been the most educated or well-spoken to do his work. He didn't call the perfect people. He called the willing. Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Myself, Brother Chase, Brother JC, Brother Larte, Brother Cody, Sister Allison, Sister Jade, and so on and so on. All have different testimonies, all have different backgrounds, all have different callings. But does that make any of us more qualified than the other? We, we all can reach different people in different ways. He may be able to reach somebody on the force that I can't reach. I may be able to reach somebody in the jail that he can't reach. I mean, look, it's, it's, it, it, is, it is what it is. I, I could just say I've been on the opposite end of the cuffs. So, you know, thank God that I'm here and not there. So are you doing your best job to live for him? If you are, then you're qualified. 
Do you have a past that isn't just rainbows and sunshine? I know I do. Then you are definitely qualified. So if, if you repented and been baptized in Jesus' name, you are qualified. Not anywhere on the list does it has to say you have to be perfect. Does it, you know, does it say you're not, you don't have to be human. You have to be an angel to, you know, to be called to be used by him. I can tell you now I'm no angel. My wife puts up with some things. And I can tell you now I'm no angel and I try my best and God works on me every day, all day. And I'm thankful for that. Just because you may have just a speeding ticket or a rap sheet that's 20 pages long. Hey, my rap sheet just means I'm more well-seasoned than the other opportunities to, to speak to people that you're not. Uh, look, I'll be the first one. Do you have a past of getting tattoos or doing drugs or partying or any above, anything above, cursing, anything like that? Then you're qualified. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you had to be perfect from start to finish because if that's the case, I don't think any of us would be sitting in here. I think, I think we would all be, we'd all be else doing other things because... Uh, Nowhere in there does it say that. Um, but we do have two people in here that we can consider pretty close to being perfect. In our eyes, in our eyes, we can, we can, we can say that, you know, we know who we want to lean on and lean after and follow. I would follow them too through thick and thin. I would, I would bulldoze the way through. You know, I, I, would, I would definitely follow them from here to the end of the earth. Let's see. Have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been incarcerated? I mean, hey, look, I'm being honest. If you have, then you're qualified. I, I've, I've been there. I've done that. I bought the T-shirt. I've been arrested more times than I want to admit. I had a rough, rough life at 17. Um, I, I had a very rough life at 17. I went from doing drugs, dealing drugs, um, you name it, I, I've done from anywhere from crystal meth to, to, to drinking alcohol to smoking weed, and I'm, I'm thankful I've been delivered from that. Amen. But I, I guarantee that makes me a pretty good candidate to being qualified to speak into people that, that have been in the same boat or are in the same boat. We did not choose him. He chose us. Once again, God does not call the qualified but he qualifies the called. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you and that you goeth forth and bringeth fruit and that your fruit shall, should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of my father's name, he may give you. The message spoken today isn't having you questioning leaving here if you're qualified, but having you knowing that you are qualified. My scripture here today wasn't long. Um, I prepared it, you know, I prayed, I fasted. I, I'm pretty quick spoken when it comes to these things. I'm usually the loud and outgoing person. But for some reason, when the mic goes in my hand, somebody puts like the mute button on or like lowers it. I, I don't know. We might have to get with the media on that one. Um, like I said, I was going to keep it kind of short, sweet, and just make a good point on it. I also want to know that, you know, I have the honor to introduce your next speaker. She is not only an amazing mom. Uh, for being a single mom, I know that's definitely rough. She, she handles her own and much more. She, she, takes, you know, she takes up for the father, the, the mother role. She takes all of it. And not only that, she keeps our church beautiful. She, she leads our worship team beautifully. She has an amazing voice. She has a beautiful son, Jensen, that we all love so dearly. And I just have the honor of introducing your next speaker, Allison Brooks. Also, I've been told we look a lot alike. I'll take her as a sister any day. Well, that was sweet. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sebastian. You made me cry. Imagine that. Um, we were just saying that we were both blue, and I was like, I'm bluer than you. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, I am. Trust me. <laughs> um, I like to give honor to Pastor and Sister Melinda, of course, for the honor and the privilege to stand before y'all. 
<laughs> all the things that I could say. Um, yep, they're true shepherds and they're true parents. They do love us all like their own kids. And um, I'll forever be grateful that our paths crossed. So I love y'all. Um, I have one quick scripture, I think. Did I give it to you? Maybe. If not, it's um, in Proverbs. Um, I think he picked me to go last because I have all of the words. <clears throat> Jensen told me that yesterday. I was reading him a devotion in the bathtub. And I was asking him, you know, if he heard me or if he was listening. Because I could tell he wasn't. He was totally checked out. And I was like, Bub, what did I just get done saying? And he was like, oh, I don't know, Mama. You just have so many words. And I was like, Okay. Just tell me how you really feel. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. Um, so Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. Y'all may be seated. Uh, when pastor asked me <laughs> to participate in this, I um, said yes, of course. And the first thing that came to my mind was um, trust. So my title tonight is going to be um, Trusting the Process. <clears throat> Last Wednesday, Sister Melinda spoke about how we need to get in position to tell our stories and how it's easy to look around and see um, how blessed we all are, um, but that there's more to the story as to how some of us got here. Um, so tonight, I personally don't feel like it's my time yet to share what I feel like is my story because no one likes to hear a story that doesn't have an ending. Uh, I feel like my story is still being written, so... I decided instead to share what I feel is more like the middle of the narrative, and I wanted to encourage those of us who might also be in that same place um, to not give up just yet and to trust the process. So tonight, um, hopefully very briefly, I want to talk about the story of Ruth and how she is one of the many people in the Bible that were given a choice to either trust in God and a God that she didn't know, okay? Okay. Um, or to go back to what was familiar after a tragedy had occurred. Her husband had died. Um, it's, a, it was, it's a terrible situation. And a lot of times in life when we face trials and hardships, one of the first things we're told is to trust God. Just trust him. I don't know if anybody in here has trust issues. Maybe it's just me. Um, but I was raised, <laughs> if my mom's in here. Oh, I'd like to give honor to my mom because she's awesome. She's the best Mita to my baby, and she's been a constant in my life, and I'm so grateful for her. Um, but I grew up listening to my mother telling me, you cannot trust no one, okay? Don't trust them. You can't trust no one. So I have trust issues. Ta-da! Um, so um, when I was thinking about trust God, because it's the first thing that popped in my head when Pastor, um, you know, asked me to speak, I thought about, um, you know, how do we do that? How do we trust in someone that we may or may not have an intimate relationship with? Um, you wouldn't leave your child with a complete stranger. So if you don't know him, how do you trust him? Trust is especially hard when you've had people in your life who are not supposed to leave, and they leave you. People who are supposed to be a constant, yet they let you down over and over and over again. Um, and if you haven't figured it out yet, that's just because they're people. <laughs> And that's what they do, or that they are capable of doing that. So how then are you supposed to trust another being that may or may not let you down as well? So when I was going through my divorce a few years ago, um, I started thinking about the ways that Ruth had to trust God and what it was about her that got her through her process of hardship and set her up for her promise. What did she do? What characteristics did she have? How did she go from being a foreigner who didn't know God, to being a blood relative of Jesus Christ himself. Well, the first thing she did was she made a choice. She made a choice to cling to someone she loved and respected and to trust that her guidance would lead her to her purpose. When tragedy hit and her husband died, Naomi gave Ruth a choice. She said, you can either come back to Bethlehem with me or go back to your mother and father to what is familiar. How many times do we face that choice? When we're standing in the midst of a trial and we're put in a position to go to the land that we might not be too attached to because, you know, we don't have that relationship yet, um, and it's fairly new, and, you know, how do we trust the godly counsel that was placed in our life to, in fact, help us? 
Or do we just go back to what we know? Do we go back to what's familiar? Um, even though that life didn't bring us happiness, we uh, weren't, you know, we weren't living up to our potential, but we know what to expect because we've been there. It's familiar. We can deal with it. Thankfully, Ruth chose to follow Naomi and to go to a foreign land. She was totally sold out to the life that she knew her mother-in-law lived and believed in. She did not take the familiar or easy road, but she did take the one that would build her and prepare her to inevitably meet her redeemer. We've all heard the phrase when we're going through a tough season that it will either make us or break us. And I feel like those words are pretty true. How we respond when life throws us, life throws us those unforeseen curveballs will truly let God know if we want to be closer to ourselves and trusting in our own abilities or if we're going to put our trust in him. Sorry, I have so many pages. I picked a very large font. <clears throat> it's really annoying, but I can see what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so what things, yeah, what things did, uh, did Ruth have? So here's some things that she had. She had character and she had durability. She was loyal to a fault and she stuck close to Naomi, who at that time in her life was her spiritual advisor. Much like pastor is to us. She clung to her. She listened to her and she did everything that Naomi told her to do. And because of that obedience and submission, that is what helped lead Ruth to her promise. When Ruth made up her mind that she would be submitted to the spiritual authority in her life, that is what ultimately caught the attention of Boaz. He knew of her story. He knew how she chose to support her mother-in-law when she could have very easily walked away and lived her own life. Another thing about Ruth was that she was a hard worker. She didn't go to the field at noon, flirt with the, the handmaid, you know, the guys that, you know, she's like, hey, you know, throw me some, you know, throw me some sheaves. No, she didn't pick up scraps for an hour, return back home and be like, here, ma, this is what you got, you know, take it. No, the Bible says that she worked from dusk till dawn and she did so with a grateful and humble heart. She knew that if she continued to do what she could do, then somehow God would make up the rest. I believe so firmly that is what God requires of us. Pastor said at Monday night that we are not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. And I believe that can be applied in our personal lives as well. The work is there. The harvest and the blessings are ready to be gleaned. But if we don't go out there and start showing that we're doing all that we can do, then somebody else is going to go out there and they're going to pick up those same sheaves that were meant for you. Ruth was selfless. She was loyal. She was always thinking of how, of how she could make, how she could help Naomi and how she could make her life easier in the midst of her her life falling apart. She was completely selfish, selfless in her servitude. She put her giftings and her worth, work ethic into serving, and Boaz took notice of her. I would say that I can attest to doing this, and it works. When we don't know what else to do in the midst of our tragedy, if we can just stay faithful to our leaders, serve in any capacity that we can, and that, that we're able to, our Redeemer will take notice. And when he does... He begins to also, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Um, he also begins to use his servants, the ones that are already living in their promises, right? The ones that, so when Boaz, you know, took notice of Ruth, he had a little conversation with her. He told his servants to take care of her, right? So when I read that today, um, I thought of, you know, the body of Christ. God uses the body, my family, y'all are my family. Y'all are, you might not be blood, but y'all are my family. So <laughs> his servants, the ones that are living in the promises that have already come to pass, he uses the body of Christ to leave behind grain from their bundles. He instructs them to keep an eye out for Ruth's that are in their process and that, that, that are learning to trust. We have some Ruth's in here that are going through things, that are still learning to trust the body of God. Um, they're still learning to trust the process. And I can't even begin to tell you how many times God has used so many of you, his servants, ones that are in the position to give me help and to help my son. Boaz told his servants, let her come and eat with them until she's had her fill. So many of you had made meals for us, blessed us by taking us out and treating us. Some have even helped by watching Jensen so that I could go to work. 
and I'll forever be grateful. And I'll never forget this part of the process because trusting God also comes with trusting the people he's blessed us with to walk beside us during our storms. And lastly, Ruth was courageous. She listened to Naomi (laughs) and she shot her shot with Boaz in the most awkward of ways. That girl broke like every modern day dating rule ever. You know, it was so awkward, but... (laughs) That was funny, right? Yeah, okay. But she did it, and in her obedience and in her process of trusting and serving, it ultimately brought her to the feet of her Redeemer. So if you get anything out of what I'm saying tonight, then I hope you get this. Trusting God isn't always easy. It's hard work. It's submission. It's saying, okay, here you go, Lord. Here are the tangible things like my finances, my career. Also, here are the intangible things like my heart, my loneliness, my anxiety, my stress. And there's also the irreplaceable things like my family and my children. I'm giving them all to you, Lord. So I might not be able to share with you yet my full testimony because I've not yet arrived at the part of my story where all the promises of God have been fulfilled. But I am living proof that the process will not kill you. It will prune you. It will test you. It will put you in positions that make you vulnerable and make you completely, fully dependent on God. But through that, it will help you build the most intimate relationship that you've never had before. It will bring you to the feet of your Redeemer. So keep serving. Be submissive and loyal. When you want to throw in that towel, doing all of those things will catch the attention of Jesus who will lay his cloak over you and provide a way when there is no way. Don't forget that the process, just because it's too hard or the pain is too much, remember that with the pain and the process, that's what produces favor and protection and will ultimately your promise. Thank you. Let's put our hands together. Let's give him some praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we lift our voices in prayer right now? What incredible words we have heard tonight. What an incredible time we have had in the Word of God. Messages that are so relevant where each of us is living in our own unique way. A time of changing the garment, pursuing the vision in a fearless way, knowing that we are qualified and understanding that there is a God that we can trust through the entire process. And I love the way God just speaks and the way God weaves and the way that the heart of God and the heart of this body is reflected and expressed through the uniqueness of each of us tonight. And I believe that every word spoke to us There are some of us, we do need to change the garment. We do need to realize that for a new season, a new garment is required. Realizing that in spite of what is going on in our world, there is a greater vision. And if we will pursue the vision, then God will take care of the violent things that are going on around us. Knowing that we cannot do that, we cannot pursue unless we are fearless so that we can keep our focus in spite of the things going on around us, again with the undergirding confidence that each of us are qualified in our own way and according to our own story. And again, knowing that our God is able to be trusted and that each of us is somewhere right now tonight. Each of us is somewhere in the process. And let me just tell you, none of our stories are complete. None of our stories are finished. We are in the process, and God is doing a great and awesome work. One more time, can we put our hands together and give him praise tonight? Thank you for the word. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the spirit of God moving in this place. Amen. And thank you, POM family, for investing in this beautiful body. 
and the ministries that are emerging. Let's have an opportunity, if you're able, shake their hand, hug their neck, let them know if they minister to you, encourage them. May God bless you and keep you. We will be back on Sunday morning, God willing, in Jesus' name. Amen.